Off the coast of Massachusetts, Jeremy Hatch and his research team noticed something strange. In several turn nests, there were more eggs than one female could possibly lay. Uh, understanding who um, attends nests of this kind is very difficult because you cannot tell male and female apart by looking at them. What we do in order to uh, establish which are males and which are females is take a small sample of blood from these individuals and identify males and females from the DNA in the blood. Once these terns are sexed, the team color mark them. They found that the nests with several eggs were attended by two females, like this pair. There are more females than males on Bird Island, and one in every ten nests is incubated by a female pair. These terns are also endangered, so could there be a link? In the 70s, female couples were found in several other bird species. Scientists thought that man-made chemicals in the environment might cause females to pair together. So have these female couples been affected by pollution? A favoured explanation has been um, that it might be due to some estrogenic uh, chemical introduced into the environment, but we have no good evidence for this. And one of the strong bits of evidence against this is that 100 years ago, there were numerous roseate terns attending nests with three or four eggs in them. This chemical theory has now been discredited, but if female pairs are normal, how do they fertilize their eggs? The e explanation for how female-female pairs lay fertile eggs is presumably um, that they copulate with males somewhere else in the colony, which we have trios that include males, but more often than not, the females that pair together do not have a male as part of that social group that's attending the nest. So the male is essentially just a sperm donor, and one of the females must take on the traditional male role, hunting for food. But in roseate terns, even in heterosexual pairs, the tasks are pretty much equally shared. While one bird keeps the eggs warm, the other is supposed to be away finding food. There is some evidence, however, that females have a slight tendency to prefer housekeeping to hunting. In our pair, there is one female who always seems particularly reluctant to leave her warm bed. In the end, she takes the hint. Apart from occasional squabbles about whose turn it is to get out of bed, what makes these female couples different? The females that are paired with other females do not differ very much from those paired with males. As far as we can tell, they don't differ in, in size. And perhaps more interesting, they don't differ in age. One of the simplest explanations would be that these are young birds, but they're not. So they have much in common, but are they any better or worse at parenting? The ways that they do differ are that they lay eggs later uh, than most of the females paired with males. They lay rather smaller eggs, and they raise young less effectively. In fact, these female pairs have set themselves a harder task. The normal clutch size is two eggs. A female in a same-sex couple has to try and sit on at least four. Then the pair has to provide food for four chicks instead of two. Varying family sizes makes the task of comparing different parenting methods more complicated. But then researchers wanting an easy life should avoid this controversial subject altogether. Take the case of the scientists who travelled two kilometres beneath the ocean surface to study the little-known deep-sea octopus.
Imagine their excitement when they began to film the first ever mating witnessed by humans between these elusive creatures. Then imagine their shock when they realized they were watching two males. And the surprises were far from over. These octopuses belong to two different species. The little white male is trying to mate with an octopus over four times his size. This finding was so extraordinary that when they returned to the surface, the scientists asked the expert, Janet Voigt, to check that they'd identified the octopuses correctly. This preserved specimen, part of the Field Museum of Natural History collections, is uh, a conspecific, that is the same species as the white guy that was attempting to copulate with the other octopus. Now, I said it was really easy to tell males from females. If you draw an imaginary line of symmetry through, in between the eyes of an octopus, there's symmetrical first arms, symmetrical second arms. He had a little damage there. But on the third arms, instead of being long, tapered, with suckers carried to the end, in males, that third arm is a little shorter, and the tip has got a grasper-type organ. This third arm is the male's reproductive organ. In these unique pictures, the smaller octopus is inserting his reproductive arm under the mantle of the larger octopus and attempting to copulate. But why? Some biologists have suggested that in these depths, octopuses encounter each other so rarely that they can't afford to pass up any chance of sex. But octopuses are known to be highly intelligent and sensitive creatures, easily able to tell individuals apart. And if the smaller male made a mistake, surely the larger male would realize this and back off. But as Janet Voigt notes, He does not seem to be at any time perturbed that the other octopus is there. And the scientists noted that as time went on, the ventilation rate of the smaller octopus increased, suggesting heightened arousal. Clearly, it's not going to help him pass on his genes to the next generation. This male is simply near the peak of his life, and he's, he's gotten abundant spermatophores produced it, it, over the course of that life, and he's had few or maybe no oppor opportunities to copulate with a conspecific female. It's impossible to say anything more about these fascinating creatures. We simply don't know enough about their lifestyle. 